Hello, welcome back, Mike from Canavan. Well, today we are talking about family money and how to approach that topic. Uh, I have been kind of prompted to this. On this just went up on the website, The Complex Water of Aging Parents Finances. This is an excellent article about kind of the things that your aging parents might be dealing with about finances, but it really prompted me to do a video about something that just, you know, out of sheer coincidence, I've been talking with lots of different clients about lately and is something that I think, you know, the focus of my practice being family wealth is something that I talk to so many clients about, which is proper stewardship of money, having conversations with between generations about, you know, passing down wealth and things along those lines. And uh, I've also been reading an absolutely fantastic book that kind of plays right into this. So what I want to first talk about is that when you are talking about family wealth, passing it down, you have to, especially if you are the younger generation, meaning you're the generation that is receiving the money or hoping to receive it, right? You're trying to talk to your folks about, you know, some type of generational wealth transfer. It has to be about you and not about them. What do I mean by that? There's two reasons it needs to be about you. The first reason is universal for virtually everything you will ever deal with in life that I have learned you know, over my years, which is you cannot control them. All you can control is you. So <laughs> trying to worry about what they think, what they do with their money, or what they think about you or their whatever views, it doesn't matter. You can't control it. You can only control yourself. The second reason is that... <laughs> When I do deal with the senior generation, which is you know probably fifty percent of the time in this business, the most the most likely reason parents are reluctant to pass down money is because they're concerned that that their children are not going to properly steward that wealth. Right? They they're either going to give up control over it, or they're just not sure that they're going to make smart financial decisions with that money. So if you're that receiving generation and you are you know trying to have a conversation about why it might be ideal to pass down wealth at this time you have to really take a deep <laughs> hard look at yourself and understand are you truly a good steward of wealth right are you worthy of receiving that money um because the truth about receiving money and wealth stewardship is that no one becomes a good steward of wealth by receiving money. It's the opposite. You have to be confident in building wealth before people are likely to, you know, within your family to want to pass that down, to, to entrust that to you, right? And you might think uh, that's like a catch-22. How do I do that in this world with so many costs and all these things? Mike, you've done, you know, seminars on the new middle class and rising costs and all of this. Well, the tool that I will tell you is definitely this one. This is a book that I have recently been reading, The Psychology of Money. It is well-known, well-reviewed, uh, very well thought of. I can, To be perfectly honest, virtually every word in this book is pure gold. It's a very easy read. There's like 21 chapters in it, these kind of 21 points. They're like four or five, six pages each. They're fantastic. This book will help you, I think, get your mindset proper in terms of the way you think about money and uh you know your attitude towards it and you know what you should largely be doing with your money so uh story time i have not been you know immune to all of this uh this when i moved here to idaho i gotten out of the military i worked for one of the potato companies here when we got here we bought this big gorgeous house up on the hill uh it, it doesn't sound like a lot back then. It was $300,000 in like 2010, which for Idaho was like an estate. And we, you know, to simply put, my wife and I both worked, both had uh, good jobs and we still live paycheck to paycheck. We largely, you know, we saved into our 401ks, but we largely spent, you know, we weren't saving for, um, you know, the purpose of building wealth later on, which this will book will tell you that, you know, it's all about saving. It's not about investing, which, you know, sounds odd coming from uh, an investment advisor. But, and throughout that time, I would often have conversations with, with my parents. Um, 
And I remember one specifically, I, you know, I was talking with my father about buying some property or whatnot that at the time I, I realized now I could not afford. And, and I remember him saying like two months ago, I had a conversation with you and you were crying poverty about living paycheck to paycheck. And now you're talking about buying some second property. It just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense, Mike. And I remember thinking that conversation, gosh, he's right. <laughs> you know, you know, where am I? And then fast forward another year or so, and I am getting, I'm leaving my job and becoming a financial advisor, signing up to make $0 a month, you know, my first month as an advisor. And at, we, but it, at that time, both the cars were paid off and we sold our $300,000 house. We bought a $120,000 house downtown. It's literally the cheapest house we found that we thought we could live in, right? Um, not to pick on my wife, she literally cried the day we decided to buy it. And uh, we renovated the kitchen also immediately because it was literally a 1960s original house. It was in a very nice neighborhood. Uh, it was a lot smaller than we were used to. And, you know, but we made that house home and I took those steps. And at that time, I, you know, I talked to my parents as kind of being a financial backstop. If we really got into trouble, uh, would they be able to be there? And of course they said uh, that they, that they would be and disaster struck like two months later. Right. So I literally just quit my job. And that winter, our SUV broke down. It didn't had started having engine problems. I had to get rid of it and I had to get a new SUV. So I went you know, I had to go buy um, an SUV at the time. We ended up getting a used one from Hertz Car Sales. It was probably the best vehicle purchase I've ever made. It was like thirty-four thousand for a two-year-old Ford Expedition at the time, and that car served us very, very well for a long time. Now it turns out I did fairly well my first few years in a, as an advisor, but but even doing well as an advisor, you really don't generate an income until several years later, and then even going into that. You know, as at that point, I started working with some other advisors who were aging out of business, started buying some books. And I took the attitude of those times, you know, your average advisor buys a book and pays it off over about 10 years. Uh, I took the attitude and get paid off as fast as I can. I effectively for, went without income for about another four years uh, in order to pay those books off so that I did not have debt overhead because this was, well, this would have been like 2017, 2019, which turned out to be typically pretty good investment years. But if you were an advisor back then, we were largely out of the 2008 global financial crisis. And we had not kind of moved into this uh, idea that recessions are going to be much further apart, but worse when they happen. And everyone was kind of assuming the market was going to fall out at any time. So I was like, I can't have these books over my head trying to pay them off and then have the market downturn. Uh, so I effectively went like six, seven years without any income. And what we we learned, you know, kind of what's important about money during that time and the security it brings. And then more importantly, when I was done paying off those books and, you know, the business had really kind of taken off at that point, we really took it on ourselves to continue to live the lifestyle that we had learned over the last seven years, which was certainly not uh, you know, one of poverty or doing without, uh, we just have lived, you know, a very comfortable life for the last 10 years. However, we did not immediately go out, buy another bigger house. You know, we did not go out and buy new cars, um, until much, much later when the, when the business was doing well. So, and it was in under that time, honestly, I look back on my financial life and I know the moment it all changed was when I sold my big expensive house and went and bought the cheapest house I could buy. You know, that and, and, and forcing myself to live on a substantially lower in order to make investments in the business uh, not only taught me the lessons that was important about wealth, but it showed my parents that I make good financial decisions. Right. And it's much easier to talk now about because my kids are college age now about, you know, where's the best place to spend for college Um we have some family properties that ultimately are going to change hands, and we talk about that. It's much easier, I believe, for my parents to see that, well, you know, Mike makes good decisions about money and, and, and my in-laws, and thus those conversations are much, much easier. So, you know, kind of in conclusion, before I, I wrap it up here, it's just the, there is no shortcut to family wealth, with the exception of when mom and dad past, right? You know, and, and that I think is why American society has moved to this notion of like, 
Well, generational wealth transfers when, when mom and dad die because, and, and it often leads to disaster, right? The much healthier approach is the younger generation really needs to figure it out, needs to figure out wealth stewardship. And, and that's your responsibility as the younger generation so that that process can start sooner and can be much more efficient, can do much more good throughout, uh, you know, kind of throughout everyone's life. That's really it. Uh, standard disclosures here. If you like the video, please do like and subscribe. I hoping again, that book was the psychology of money. Just absolutely fantastic. I hope to do some videos on the individual chapters from the perspective of a financial advisor. He's kind of writing to, for personal finance. I, uh, the other side of that, I think there's some, some interesting things that could be said around those. So, uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to get to that, but, uh, otherwise I hope it's been informative and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.